I think this video maybe needs a forward. So what we're trying here is my friend Vince, who I studied with, asked me, or actually I pushed him to learn Houdini together. So what you're witnessing here are Vince's first steps inside of Houdini, and we thought we'd record it. So this is just the mostly unedited Zoom session. And the hope here is that maybe you guys take something away from it. Maybe the more professional Houdini users can gauge how a newbie in Houdini is approaching the software and what problems and issues they are facing. And maybe if you're working for side effects and designing the UI and UX, you can take away something from this as well. And if you're just starting out using Houdini, maybe you can just, I mean, empathize or follow Vince's steps in what we're building here. Again, this is an unedited Zoom session. Expect this not to be at the same pace as our standard Entagma content, but maybe that helps you to follow along or just maybe have this on the side while you're working on something else. So enjoy and have fun. And Vince, you decided for some reason to start um, using Houdini. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, first of all, hello everyone. And thanks to Moritz for helping me out there because I'm trying to learn this for, uh, I don't know how many years I'm saying this year I will learn it, but I'm always too lazy somehow. At least this time Moritz is really pushing hard. So we are now in a one-to-one -one session and I can't find any more excuses. Yeah, I was kind of pushing you towards this. Apologies Perfect. for that. So um, perhaps what... this video can be pretty good for everyone who's like me, stuck in Cinema 4D, but perhaps this will give you an idea how quickly you can do something. Let's hopefully we can quickly do something. <laughs> or it'll give you an idea of at least what to expect or um, kind of the downsides. Um, maybe both actually, a view into what's positive and what's negative about transitioning to and using Udini. Nice. So we had like a 20 minute session before this, where we built a very simple setup using uh, Vellum. Um, we had like two um, stripes of cloth falling on, I think, I think two cylinders. Um, just to give you a general idea of what it is working with nodes. Um, what shall we do today? Perhaps we should recreate the same scene to refresh in the minds and for everyone who's like a beginner as me can do like this very basic setup and then perhaps you can try to recreate the scene which you showed me while well, I quickly open up my Instagram stream here and I made one shot obviously not with Cinema 4D I used Marvelous and that's going to be this one mm -hmm. and we will try to recreate that in Houdini plus right. I also have an animation rendered which I'll show you here. So this might be our goal to recreate because I think this is impossible to do in Cinema 4D. And yeah. Okay, starters That's... a bit for me, but I think I get the idea. It's this bunch of ribbons falling down onto these stones. Exactly. All right. Um, yeah, let's start by recreating what we already have and then uh, we can modify this into a setup uh, very similar to what you've shown here. Nice. So what let's try. Do you, what do you still remember? What what we have to <laughs> reiterate? <laughs> well, I remember tab. That's a good start. Tab, it's a good one. So tab um, over this area where you are um, allows you to search all the nodes that Houdini offers you. That means. So we need a geometry node, as far as right. I remember. Right. The geometry node is just. Uh, it, you could compare it to a null in Cinema 4D. It's a bit more, it's a geometry container and you create geometry inside of it. Then we go inside of it and I will create another thing. I don't know, did we create a cylinder? No, Cil... Uh, I think we did create a cylinder, yeah. How is it called? Cil... Tube. Tube, ah. Yeah, it's, yeah. Tube. And just, there are two tubes, one create, one primitive. They are the same node. One is just set up to create polygons. The other one is uh, set up to create a primitive. In our case, we wanted to use the create node, which generates polygons. Perfect. So then we need caps. That's our yes. remember. Mm -hmm. Then we need to rotate this guy by 90 degrees. Something like that. Then we need to change the values a bit. The radius was too much. Oh, didn't know that you have two sides. Yeah, That's kind of yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah, you can do Look. like, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. You can do that. Um, and last time um, I remember you being irritated a bit by um, what units those are. And Houdini itself is unitless. So um, usually 
In studios that use units, Houdini units are thought of as meters, but essentially Houdini is unitless. So in the end, it doesn't matter as long as you're consistent within your scene. For now, let's think about those units as meters. Yeah, I was really confused about that because Cinema 4D is really important to work in real life scale because I don't know if you work with a camera, the lens is different, the depth of field is different if you work in a huge scene and also the dynamics are very different. So that's why. Actually, how is it here? Well, because I, I know how a real camera works with a real aperture and the depth of field, like when does it work realistically in which kind of numbers or scale? That's a good question. I think when you assume the um, scene units as meters, um, it works um, realistically. I have to check that. Um, I'm not sure, but I assume it is. That it so works. this is 10 centimeters exactly. in our That's talking now here. 10 centimeters, that means the diameter of the tube is 20 centimeters. Nice. And I think we need more subdivisions. Or are they relevant for the simulation? For the collision, yes. So if they are too low, you can see them just being... Well, let's um, make it 32. Yeah. Then the next thing was called the plane. How was it called? Wait, don't say it. Um, floor? Grid. No. Grid, damn it. No worries. That's that's one of the annoying parts with every program. <laughs> you have to learn the nomenclature for some of those parts. Yeah, everything is different. Okay. Then there was a thing which showing you have to click on the blue That's thingy the flag, to show exactly. it, and you could show both of them with the purple one, right? Um, yeah, yeah, the purple one, and you um, can also shift click the purple one if you want to have more purple, and um, that's the template flag, the purple one, or oh, yeah. so as I let's... sometimes call it, ghosting, but that's just me. So um, it's a template flag that allows you to show multiple objects as wireframes in the scene. Nice. Then let's change the By the way, I need to remove our faces a little bit. <laughs> let's put them <laughs> here. <laughs> I can't see them, by the way. You can no, see them. No, no, no. I, I see only your um, UI here and only our faces on the side. Ah, okay. But, okay, yeah. Then I will make them even smaller. <laughs> Or it's nice to see you. I will just only show you. I don't need to see myself. Oh, that's cute. Nice. So the size is way too big. Yeah. Let's drop it down to something like that. And well, now I need to see my tube to uh, shift here. Okay. Grid. Perfect. So we need to move this guy up. And there was the tool to be able to move everything around here that's this one yeah is there a shortcut for this guy uh enter enter i'm not just sure. enter well let's try to click somewhere else enter nice enter is easy so i'm not, I'm, I'm not using much shortcuts in houdini so i'm definitely you're all doing everything with tab or most of the time and just entering numbers and just being stupid about it i mean that's not the most efficient way i have to admit um, I'm just too lazy to learn shortcuts. That's why also Blender sometimes is a headache for me. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine that. So it's a bit too short. Let's make it longer. Uh, longer. And our polygons are not good. No, the, so for simulation, the polygons, um, at least for class simulations, should be close to um, quadratic. Um, so yeah, adjust the rows and columns accordingly. Yeah, we are getting close. 99 to 4. How would you say <laughs> simulation speed? Is that's, still... fine. That, that's fine. There's nothing like four, that's 400 points that you're simulating there. It's nothing. It's not nothing for cinema. No, well, for Houdini, that is nothing. Okay, cool. That's a good start. Then what else do we need? The vellum thing. Yes. So, so... vellum, 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 vellum. Oh, there's a lot of vellum. Mm -hmm. Vellum. Wait, vellum. There's one under the configures that you need. Configure. Where can, what, where can I see you configure? What? Ah, here, in, this in, below. In, in, in the middle, there's vellum configure balloon, configure cloth, configure fluid, configure grain, configure hair. Yeah. And which one do I need? The cloth. Cloth. Yeah, we want to do cloth. Vellum. Uh, damn it. Pretty much in the middle. In the middle, okay. Well, I'm configure grain, fluid, cloth are here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so 
The okay. right one was the collider buddy. Yep. So this guy goes in the collider. And the dynamic one goes in the left. Other way around. Other way around. Yeah, you Dang. want the, the stuff to collide with the tube. So the tube is the collider. So the tube goes in the left and the grid. Yeah. So let's, I don't know, do we need something else? Yep. Yep. This is just Physics. setting it up. This is just setting it up. So um, now we need to solve all this and we want this to, to be solved step by step. So we need a vellum solver. Yep. Ve you can just, um, the search bar is fuzzy, so you can just type vel solve or something or vel solve. Vel -sol. Yeah, there it is. Vellum solver. And now if you want to join them um, and don't want to wire up each of those ports individually, you hold down J for join. J. Yeah, J for join. And your icon becomes like a needle. And now you um, click on the vellum cloth and then on the vellum solver and connect all three of them. Or just, I think it's hold and drag maybe. Hold and drag. Yeah, like this. Oh, yeah. That's nice. Or it was with shift, I could have, it would have okay. automatically. If you had the vellum cloth selected, so if it was outlined yellow, it was still highlighted from a selection and you drop down your node while holding shift. So with shift and return, it would be wired up automatically. Okay, shift, perfect. And what else did we have to do? Nothing, set the view flag on the vellum solver. View flag on the vellum solver. Hit play. Hit play. Woo, it's ready. <laughs> Congratulations, your first or second simulation. Nice. Okay. Um, let's see. How can we make the tube look... Oh, wait. We need, first of all, the real-time... Yeah, the real-time toggle is below the uh, playback bar. The, below the, clock, the, clock the clock icon. Yeah. The clock yeah, you were icon. just there for the clock. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Then the ghosting, when I turn this off... No. How can I see the normal geometry from the You gotta tube? merge it. You have to merge I'll it merge. with your simulated geometry. Simulating geometry. Okay. So use a merge node and merge the first output of your vellum solver with your collision geometry. So wait, merge node, I need to merge the tube. Mm -hmm. And the output with of your vellum solver. The this one. Mm -hmm. And oh, damn it! Output just not in just here. the middle one. The middle one is the constraints that you're generating for your simulation geometry. So that's the yeah, which one? The left one I have to use. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The uh, pink one, the pink slot in vellum, is always used to describe the connections within the vellum simulated geometry. So damn it! How can I move this? Ah, uh, no! I lost all connections. <laughs> And you go back you in can, here. You don't, you don't have here. to. You don't have to drag and click connections. You can click on one end of the connection and then. Ah, yeah, I forgot that. Go. That's why it was way easier. And we need to click the blue one. Nice. Great. Then after our last call, I tried to continue with my simulation, and I was wondering: is there like a thing like a cloner? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so there are two modes, one um, standalone mode that is not so powerful and one very powerful node and both are called or one is called copy and transform and the other one is called copy to points. Let's start with the copy and transform first. Or copy, copy. Or, or maybe it's called just copy, I'm not using it. First one is copy and transform. Yeah, either it's called copy or copy and, yeah, copy and transform. Let's use that one. Okay. And I can click in between. No. Yeah, you can do that. Um, just set the view flag on that copy node first so we can copy. see what we're doing here. And now um, where it says performance monitor, um, back when you were struggling or finding that stuff, you accidentally clicked up here. Just uh, click on here. Press. Just click yeah. on here to bring back the um, uh, yeah, yeah. parameters. So you can see we're doing two copies here. However, um, we are not modifying this. So those copies sit in place and what you have to do and, or you can do is for each copy, just specify transforms here. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do with each copy step. So let's try out point one. 
And that moved it uh, 0.1 unit in the X direction. The okay, this is the wrong direction. Was it? Wait, how was the trick with the moving up and down? Oh, damn it. <laughs> It was not shift. You mean you mean the value ladders? So if you yeah. middle now, if you hold your middle mouse button in there. Ah, yeah, this was, and now you, you can the ladder. You can... Ah, yeah, perfect. Okay, but anyway, this is the wrong axis. So let's move here and ah, yeah, here. Looks about right. Yeah. Now you can increase the total numbers, and it's going to create copies. So let's start with eight. But Anyone? our down movement is perhaps too much. So let's get rid of the these ones. And we need more. 0.15. Yeah. So next Cinema 4D classical move would be the random effector. Mm -hmm. Is this Something. So, so for that, we would need um, the other way more powerful way of working here, um, which is using template points and using copy to points. Um, so if you want to, you can try out that. Um, okay, let's try it out. That's good. Always trying out is good. Merge out view and our thingy needs to be a bit bigger. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you just click in the viewport on objects? Mm -hmm. Select them. Yeah, if you have the selection. Uh, this uh, guy. Here. Uh, but I, would, just... I'm, I, I wouldn't use the viewport actually to do that. I would just go in here and click that. And it needs to be longer radius, scale, height. You're still, you're still uh, in the copy and transform. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, now I'm it's still in the, no, in no, the tube. Maybe it was just like the, it was just my zoom not being quick. Oh yeah. Zoom is delaying. Let's make it extra long. So it's safe. And we need to move it a bit more to the left, left. Nah, damn it. Um, you see down here, That's there's wrong. the axis cross. So you see the axes. Okay. That's good. So like that, will it hit? Yeah, I think so. Let's press play. Whoa, it's still super fast. <laughs> <laughs> Your zoom is just like giving me like half a frame a second or something like that. So <laughs> it really doesn't look fast, but uh, yeah, that's still not. Yeah, I mean, should I? I still have cinema open. Should I rebuild this? <laughs> yeah. You can do as you want. Um, I'm just here for the Houdini part. Let's see, we don't need this many frames. That's good. So that's a good start. Let's okay. try out the next step, random. Okay, let's, yeah, let's try out randomizing those positions. So um, when you're coming from Cinema 4D, um, Houdini requires you to think about um, what what is called the cloner in Cinema 4D or the copy to points in Houdini um, the other way around. So in Cinema 4D, you would first create your copies, your instances, and then transform them using a bunch of effectors. Right? Yeah. In Houdini, you create a bunch of points, create a bunch of attributes and values on them, and then use the values stored on each individual point to copy a single copy of your geometry onto each point and transform it accordingly to what's stored on each point. Sounds complicated. We'll go through it. Sounds good. Let's do it. So first, let's create a bunch of points where we want to uh, put our copies onto. For that, we can use a line, for example, for now. A line. Okay. Let's go with a line. And make that point along the x direction. So where it says direction, enter a vector that says one zero zero. One zero zero. So now, it's, oh no, we wanted to to point in the z direction. Sorry. So zero one. No, zero zero one. Exactly. Zero zero one. Perfect. Now it's in the two, but uh, you can move the origin upwards a bit on the y axis. Let's try point five. That's the direction. Wait, do you, you meant the direction, right? No. No, I meant the origin. So you uh, origin. Trans, you what, what's the, the difference thing. between direction and try it's... putting zero point five in the origin as well, and you see it. Uh, this is like the like a rotation. Yeah, it's the it's it, it's just a vector. It tells it it tells you in which direction of a vector the line is pointing. Ah, uh, okay. So it's not really rotations, but similar. 
Um, wait a second. So if you click on, if you uh, set the view flag on the line again, and then enable the point display in the viewport, you can see that this thing has only um, two, points. two points. We need more, or we want more than just two. It's points. one point, one clone then. Yes. So let's, I don't know, try 10 clones perhaps. That's fine. Um, all right. Now, um, let me see. Or 12. <laughs> Whatever you want. Um, for now, uh, let's drop down a copy to point node or copy to points. Copy to point, copy to points. And that has two inputs. In the first one, the left one, um, you enter the geometry that the clones should be made of. And in the right one, you enter the points onto which those should go. Okay. Exactly. And now if you set the view flag onto the copy of, uh, onto the copy to points. Yes, I flagged it. Oh yeah, now you can see it sits a bit above the line because our grid itself, I think we moved it up from our origin. So yeah, should I go back to zero? Um, if we want to do this way, yeah. Zero and rotation also zero. Um, you can leave that, um, for now you can leave it or you can zero it out. It doesn't matter in this case because okay, we will um, set the rotation in a second anyways. Okay. Then zero, zero is better. Okay. Copy okay. to point. So now we've got these stripes. They're just oriented a bit weirdly, um, 12 times, um, copied onto those points. So to orient um, those copies, those individual clones, copies, whatever you want to call them, instances, we need to um, write a few attributes or one attribute onto each individual point in this line. So below the line, we will use, um, let's use an attribute randomize node. It comes in between the yes. line and the yes. copy to so point. Can we need the line a bit exactly and then wire in there an attribute. Wait, well, let's try it with the shift. I have to select it and then. Attribute Rand randomize. Randomize and shift, was it? Shift enter should shift wire enter. it up directly. Perfect. There it is, but you need to wire it into the copy to points now. So it didn't inject it into the already existing connection. It just wired it onto it. So you can see now um, a bit weird colors coming through. That is because attribute randomize by default is set up to attribute to randomize the color. So you can also use this workflow to set your instances color, for example, which you don't want. What we want um, is position. No, no, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's try. Yeah, let's try uh, the position. So for that, under the attribute name here, exactly, try selecting if we already have a positional attribute. Yeah, we have it already. So now you can see. That's good. Um, a good start. You see the underlying line there that still connects those points. We just ignore the line. We are only yeah. caring about those individual points, but you just randomly offset their position for now. And under the distribution and the options, you can dial in how that random value is generated, how strong it should be, um, all okay, those shenanigans. Mm, less distortion. Dimension is... So dimension um, oh. says um, I want a random value in either X, Y, Z, which is three dimensions, or I only want a random value in X, Y, or U, V, oh, okay. which is two dimensions, or I only want one random value in X, for example. So uh, if I don't want this much of a distortion, I need to clamp the max value. Exactly. Yeah. Just lower nice. the max value. And let's say some of them would intersect. Is it also that bad in Houdini when starting geometry is intersecting at frame zero? Depends on your type of simulation, your type of setup. Usually I would say it is bad. It is not as bad as in other tools I've seen, but I would try avoiding it if possible. What if now we have points intersecting? How to avoid that? Just by eye and just running the changing the values till there's no intersection or? Well, I mean, in this case, as you're working with template points, so you're using points onto which you copy the instance, you could just make sure that those points onto which you copy those instances are not intersecting. And for that, there's a really neat tool called point relax. Mm -hmm. 
So you would wire in a point relax after your attribute would randomize and- Yeah, perhaps but let's first do the rotation because the rotation will probably give us some intersection. Yeah, and those intersections are kind of hard to fix them. <laughs> um, but let's yeah, do the, I, I um, understand why, because we only think about points here that Houdini is not seeing the whole line of the grid. Exactly. Um, what we would typically do is just, um, for example, for some of the, for the animation that you showed, um, I would rather spawn those individual strands, those individual, um, ribbons individually spaced apart to make sure that they're not intersecting at first and just spawn a lot of them in the air, just like, and then have them fall down for now. Let's go with this and yeah. randomize uh, the rotation. Um, so I think you can use an after randomize again. So another after randomize that you drop in there. Uh, so I, it, only one thing can do one value. Yep. There are some, there are some nodes that can do multiple operations, but usually only one node. Is there the, operation. can you alt drag it to duplicate it? I've never tried that. Oh yeah, it works. Yeah, you can. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm learning here. Make Perfect. sure it's wired into the copy to points. Exactly. And now um, we have to know this by heart. Um, there is also a help entry that specifies all the, how those attributes should be called. For now, let's call this one Orient with a small and O. I was guessing for R. R. Orient. Oh, wait, I can see Orient. Yeah, small O. Small O. Does it make a difference? Yeah. Damn it. And now we have to know that this is a quaternion, so you need to set the dimensions to four. Dimensions to four. And then for distribution. Distribution. Yeah, it's above the dimensions. Above, yeah. Let's set this one to direction or orientation. Direction, and I would have been lost already. How is, that's kind of, not so easy to randomize the rotation. Um, not if you're not used to working in 3D engines, that's right. Um, so every single 3D engine, um, including tools such as Cinema 4D, Maya, uh, Marvelous Designer, to represent rotations, they use what's called a quaternion. Quaternion is a vector with four components that does some really weird and funky math to tell a software, okay, something is oriented this way in space. The really nice thing about quaternions is that you can interpolate, that means animate between them without them ever flipping. Mm -hmm. As you have with uh, Euler angles, for example. Um, internally, everything in those tools gets converted to that. Houdini just gives you the bare metal. There would be other ways to work around this, but this is really the briefest way to randomize a direction. It's just directly write out random values into those quaternions for each point. Okay. So you have to know or, that or you have go to... In? Okay, for those, those are a bit different. So if you go to the, if you uh, click on the copy to points node, uh, knowing, knowing how to I... call the attributes, we'll figure that out, yeah. Um, just click on it, just select it. So you bring up the properties tab. And then in the properties tab, you see there's this question mark in the right hand corner here. That's the help. Takes a while to load. And then, um, you can see if you, if you read that the, the documentation here is consistent, um, mm -hmm. and it's written like a, you would expect a programmers or programming language, um, documentation to be written. So, um, up here, it says here for, whoop, for more information. I'm already scrolling and you're delayed. Yeah. 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 Um, I see copying to points in the copying and instancing chapter. If you go there, copying to points, and then you scroll down to transforming the copy. So you also see this chapter up here. Doesn't matter. Sorry, it's too fast. Doesn't matter. I'm just saying here on this page, you see here transforming to the copies, and that's where you want to go. So now, if you scroll down a bit, or wait, 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 wait. I think you're still late. Yeah. Yeah, this is what you want. So here you can see how everything is called that does something oh, yeah. in the copy and uh, copy to points. 
P scale, uniform scale, S scale, non-uniform scale, N, normal, up, V, root, P, trans, okay. We can talk about a few other ways of orienting those copies in a moment if you want. So closing the guy again. Yep. And now you see your stuff randomly oriented. Mm -hmm. I do. And now you can wire that into the vellum configure cloth. Vellum configure cloth. Then it might intersect with uh, with itself or with the collider, but let's just give it a try. Let's just highlight the Velum solver or your merge and let's just play that. So for example, in cinema, I would have to save now. I would get nervous because of this here. I mean, saving before running a simulation is never a bad idea. Um, let's save this. Going into this ancient design <laughs> of our UI. <laughs> yeah, welcome to Linux or welcome to Unix or whatever Fuck you like guys, to call it. Come on, come <laughs> on. <laughs> Test, hip. Nice. And I'm, <laughs> I just tried to zoom around and I clicked two. <laughs> ah, damn it, Zimmer. You can also, if you're, if you're over the viewport and yeah. um, hold down space and H, you reframe your whole um, ah, entry. Yeah. Okay, let's press play. Ah, oh, wait, I need to click the the view flag on the merge. View flag on merge. View flag on the merge, <laughs> not fucking merge. <laughs> At least something is happening. Uh, yeah, because you um, just skipped ahead and it's trying to catch up in the simulation. So wait, let's select the sky and... Um, Wait, I did select the point. How do I unshow the points? No. I'm still in point mode. My um, zoom is just very laggy currently, so I'm not sure <laughs> what you're doing. Okay, I just ah, okay, okay, okay. I think I, I think I see it now. Okay, just click on that one here. Just click on the tool handle. Now you're before you were in point selection mode, and now uncheck this here. Ah, nice. So let's see what's happening. It's doing a pretty good job. Yeah, for geometry that has been intersected at the beginning, it does. Yeah. Here is some intersection. Yeah. But yeah, not bad. Let's try to avoid some intersections, I would say. Okay. So. As you so see, the random rotation was way too much. Mm -hmm. Going to the sky and... You could try checking um, cone, cone angle and bias towards direction. Cone angle? Let's and activate bias, that. And, yeah. Let's, yeah. Um, and put the view flag on your copy to points so you're seeing uh, the way your copies are oriented. Yeah, that's... It's a good start. It will help to prevent the collision with the tube, at least. Yeah, now you can but dial in the cone angle or cone the duration of the rotation. One. By the way, where's the random position now? Should still be there. But it's kind of not, isn't it? You can, you can check um, by bypassing, which means enabling or disabling this flag on your atrib randomize. You can check if you bypass that, if it's still doing something. So I click on the yellow button. Yeah, so now it's disabled? It's no difference. Hmm, that is interesting. Then disable your attribute or randomize for the Orient. Yeah, there's, it's, there's not, wait, did we, did we kick it? No, it's still kind of. That is super weird. It looks like here there is some yeah, points. Yeah, it's definitely randomized in the position here. That worked. And so. now if you uh, set the view flag on the copy to points again. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> I 
Right, we are bypassing the random the rotation. Yeah, it, does, yeah, it doesn't so. it doesn't matter um, because we are caring about the position currently. That's nice. Move the move this attribute randomized to the side. Wait, it's back. No, no, move that P back to move that P a bit over there. I have the feeling it's not connected. Yeah, now it's connected. So what happened is um, by holding shift and pressing enter, you always just connect down and you don't insert nodes in there. So what was happening, although those nodes were overlapping, this one was not connected. The P wasn't connected to the rest. Oh. So you had from this here, from this line, you had one going here into the P and the other one going directly into this one. And only this one then got passed to the um, copy to points. Let's see the sneaky boy. Mm -hmm. So let's stop the bypassing. Click yes. Now we can. Now you can dial in the orientation. Change the orientation a little, uh, a little bit more as possible. Yeah, sure. So let's see five. And what's the bias towards direction? What's if that? If you if if you hover on it and don't move the mouse, just hover on this. <laughs> well, okay, that's a helpful. That's a helpful text. Usually, that displays the help text there. Again, <laughs> you can always look up your stuff here, which I encourage you to. Uh, and again, you have to scroll down to the parameters until you see the bias towards direction. You can also um, hit Control and F and search for something here, just like the normal browser. Anyway. So bias towards. No, 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 no. This this will search the whole documentation ah, okay. on a single page. Bias this will search, yeah. Towards the right. There, there you go. Here. Okay, so that's not your direct answer. <laughs> Go down. That's also, uh, I'm just a graphic designer, not a computer boy. Yeah, I uh, know. What? <laughs> Scroll down a bit. Scroll down. I am biased towards the direction. Scroll down further. Slides here. There's no further. So usually um, what bias um, or bias towards direction means, it, it means that the randomly generated samples will tend more towards the direction that you specified in the direction tab than those random values. So, so let's not, try so, one. So if you, yeah. 100, 10, 100. So see, now they're tending more um, towards this um, directional vector, which you input there, which um, points along the direction of one zero zero zero. So in this case, it behaves like the strength for the random effect. In, so this zero. in this particular case, you could view it if you would as that, but I like to things uh, to see things easy. I mean, if you want that, you can download Mops that's available for free and that uh, my friend Henry uh, maintains, um, which is a bit more similar to how Mesh or MoGraph in Cinema 4D works. Mops. That's a, yeah, that's a free add-on. It's motion operators. Everything, mm. everything in Houdini is called Ops. So you're working in SOPs, which is surface operators currently. Okay. If it's easier, then... Um, I. It depends what preference you have. Um, it has some really nice high level notes um, for exactly that type of stuff, which is, I think, a bit easier than what side effects provides you with by default. But for now, okay. let's stick with it. I mean, you have some slightly random um, orientation there, so it's not yeah. perfect and it's not intersecting either. So um, let's just re-simulate this. Wait, there's intersection. Well then. Either dial back the cone angle or increase the position. Is there a angle. seed value? Uh, yes, under options. Under options. Oh, ah, yeah. And Wait, again, the mouse up and the, down. The scroll wheel should also work. Oh, ah, yeah. So this is a little bit better. And now we're changing the values for the uh, X. No, wait, damn, it was wrong. That was Y, but... Y. 
That is Z. Is Y, no, Z so is X, Y, Z. And then in this case, there's a fourth parameter, which for position doesn't get used. So it's the first three that count. But this is just doing nothing. Nope. Yeah. Okay. And a bit more here. Yeah. Well, we got still some. Perhaps less rotation. Less rotation. Uh, distribution. Let's change this bias guy and the angle. By the way, is there, how can I, for example, only randomize the orientation on the uh, H, H axis, like this one? Oh, you mean the rotation around the Z axis? Um, <laughs> in reality, that's where I would use mops. Um, yeah, we use mops for that. Okay, mops I need to install first. Perfect. But... Let's say we are happy with the result so far. There is no intersection, I guess. Looks good. Cool. Let's see. Um, is everything connected right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. What about this guy? Can, should we delete, delete it? Or? Delete it. We don't need it anymore. Then you can move the grid over there to the left side so your network is a bit cleaner. Grid to the left. Yeah, so it just isn't crossing. Um, you have these crossed streams down there, these crossed node connections. Never cross the node connections. <laughs> so why? What's happening? It's nothing. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Houdini boys will get angry. Um, but also now um, everything is oriented uh, towards our collider. Oh, yeah. How did that happen? Um, we reset the rotation. Are we the rotation, exactly. Um, rotation. So Either you readjust your collider or you, or you readjust the orientation of your grids. It doesn't matter. The collider. Let's reorientate the collider because okay. that we... Wait, no. Ah, yeah, collider is easier. 90 degrees. Oh, obviously. You can 90. also... Yeah, I like that. And... Um, you also have this setting here that, uh, that tells you in which direction the um, tube is going. Oh, yeah before you translate it or transform it. Okay, let's press play. Oh. <laughs> and some of those are just falling down. That's good. Yeah, I think it's a good start. Okay, how can we make it a bit more? Let's have a quick look on some basic vellum settings. Press this can be a bit more softer. By softer, what do you mean? They feel quite rigid. Okay, it's hard uh, for me to judge because I'm getting about one FPS here, but um, yeah, sure. So um, with vellum, you always have two main locations of settings where you, that you want to dial in. First, um, the settings where you configured your vellum objects, so your cloth or your grain or whatever, your soft body, and then the, the, vellum solver, cloth. And then yeah. the solver itself. So for now, let's uh, focus on the cloth. So in here, um, the first thing you want to pay attention to is the edge length scale. If you check visualize thickness, you can see now you've got these tiny um, spheres around each point. Yeah. And what Vellum does internally is Vellum only cares or simulates the positions of those spheres and also only um, the collisions of those spheres. So anything that's in between, there's no collision happening. Yeah. And basically this radius of your spheres now is your cloth's thickness as well. So if- Kind of the collision way, margin. Yeah. So if for some reason you want thicker cloth or you're getting intersections where cloth is penetrating in between, you need to either increase your point count. So you have points all over the place so that there are no sparse areas or you have to increase your points radius, which you do with the edge length scale. Yeah, so our cloth would have a thickness of 0 0.25 right now. 
0.25 times whatever this distance here is. The thickness of the cloth. Yeah, the thickness of the cloth you can see. I mean, this, this radius here, yeah? Yeah. Is 0 0.25 times this distance here. So the cloth is actually very thick right now. Mm, not really. I mean, it depends. For my taste, not, but in the end, it depends what you expect from your cloth. By the way, when we were at it, we could make a cloth surface out of it. This is a good. Uh, yeah, we can make a cloth surface out of it after the vellum solver. Or should we do that in cinema? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> but let's say, anyway, I have to render everything later on in cinema. Yeah. Is it better to put the cloth thickness in Houdini or in cinema? Well, I, if you ask me, Houdini, but you will get that. But you tell you have to render in. You have to render in cinema. Yeah, I wouldn't render in cinema. <laughs> Dude, well, I'm a hardcore beginner. I have to use cinema. Well, the thing is, it, in in this case, it doesn't matter. Um, then do it in cinema. Um, just the vellum post process that's being used to do that here in Houdini is really fine. I um, mean, it, it does a good job. You could also do it in cinema. It doesn't matter in this case. Okay, but let's do it. So we did it and we learned about it. We need a cloth thickness. That's That hides um, under a note called vellum post process. Vellum post process. And that goes directly beneath the vellum solver, not beneath. After the, the merge or? No, directly after the vellum solver. Before the merge. Yeah. It's getting kind of small here, so. <laughs> yeah, welcome to working in Houdini. Here. Yep. And do I need to connect something else? Uh, you might want to connect just for good measure, want to connect the um, constraints, but I think you might not need them in this case. These ones can yep. go in. And then on the vellum post process, what you can do first is do a bit of blurring. So if there's any kinks in your surface, you can blur them out, which you don't need in this case. Um, you can give them uh, maybe a few subdivisions, just one step of subdivisions. Oh, that's right. That's one step. Wait. Use the one Clark, step. exactly. One step of subdivisions. Um, so it's already subdivided. And then if you scroll down, you have thicken, extrude by thickness. There you have your cloth surface. So you said something 0 0.25 times, I don't Whatever know. Whatever the distance of these connections is. But how do I know, like... Well, the thickness, the thickness scale just takes this points radius here and just uses that as the distance. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, and that's... No, 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 you don't have to change anything. It just takes the points right. thickness and multiplies that by one, so it keeps the points thickness. And that's just, that's just the thickness your cloth is being simulated at. And... Uh, points did change now are they always changing when i'm changing the value here yeah of course because it's a multiplier what they do is they take the points radius each of those points that are being simulated here yeah yeah and now you're multiplying this radius by one which scales this cloth exactly this radius here okay yeah? so if you multiply it by 0 0.25 it's only a quarter of that but um it's not the actual thickness this cloth has been simulated at then. But let's make it smaller. It looks quite thick, 0.5. And let's see how the simulation looks. This will be slow because the vellum post process will subdivide it now each frame. So this will display a good bit slower than the simulation without the vellum post process. Yeah, same as cinema. So if you want to... Get rid of that. You could now use a file cache and cache that out in between so it runs fluidly or you just disable it for now to see if your animation is all right um, or you just live with it being a bit slower. Yeah. But we still have quite some collision margin, right? If I'm looking at this well, if, you want here. To, if you want to make it smaller, either go into the uh, Velum Configure Cloth and dial back the edge length scale or um, increase the subdivision of your um, of your ribbons. Okay, we can do both. Okay. Um, well, actually, I accidentally pressed 2 and 2 makes the point mode. Yeah. 
So you click back on your tool handle here. Tool handle and get rid of ah, perfect. I don't have to click here. Less. Um, to the points of the vellum cloth. Yeah. Now you can see the radius here. Radius. And that is driven edge by length, length scale. scale. Exactly. So I don't know what's point one. Or what would you say? It really depends on your use case. It really depends um, how thick or thin you want your cloth to behave. In our simulation right now, let's see. Oh, wait, this, I have to. Um, let's, if I bypass it here, it's not calculated. That's correct. Nice. Then. So now what you're witnessing is you were on frame 27 when you yeah. um, set that view flag and then it took a while because it, what it now did, um, Houdini realized that you changed some of your simulation parameters and um, re-simulated this whole timeline here. Oh, that's why, nice. So if you want, to if you change simulation parameters, it's good practice to reset your playback bar to frame one here by just hitting this button. And there was some intersection. That's probably because the collision is too small now for the subdivision amount here, right? Exactly, exactly. So you want to increase your rows and columns in your grid where you um, generated those okay. ribbons. So I think we also need more here, probably. Or more. And the grid needs also more. Oh wait, line. line. That's the Which wrong one. That. Exactly. Grid. Let's try 122 and 5. So this would be, for example, already very slow in cinema. This is still nothing. Still nothing. That's I would nice to hear. I would increase it to 250 by 6 or to 256 uh, by 6. 250? 250? Mm -hmm. 256, yeah. Are you crazy? <laughs> no, I want some Fucking hell. <laughs> Let's see. Whoa, it's still going. Pretty fast. It's actually very fast. Again, for me, it's like one FPS, so I can't really judge. <laughs> <laughs> Looks nice. So yeah, okay. I think um, yeah, I think I would just make sure that uh, my grid has kind of um, square. Also, subdivisions the grid. Subdivisions. I oh, wait the the grid. Yeah, it's a bit too not square enough. So we need five points, perhaps. Wait, it was seven. Seven. Yeah. Yeah, maybe seven. eight. Yep, something like that. Okay. I think there are many things to learn here. Let's go for it. But uh, what is this thing here? Red lined kind of. I mean, that's. Okay, 250 that, grid that's, rows. That's, that's Houdini's way of trying to be nice and offer you some viewport tools so you can dial in the rows and columns there in the viewport as well. But. Ah, no one does that. I, I haven't used those much. I'm not sure. Maybe um, I just don't use that much. So I think it's a good time to look back onto the vellum thing because the edge is kind of ugly. This yep, they fray. Wave rave. They fray. So they are getting jaggy. Yeah. Okay. So it's the vellum cloth guy or so the solver. That is actually the solver, I think, because now that we're in high res or rather high res ish mode, you can see that now here is the right tab that now the constraint durations and sub steps cannot catch up properly with the, with what you're demanding. So I told you vellum always works on those individual points. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now each ribbon has more than a hundred points along its longest direction. So they cannot really settle. They cannot really propagate, um, with only a hundred constraint durations. So it's 50% right now. Every second looks about right. Yeah. So one thing you could do is um, increase the constraint durations to 256. Um, the other one, if that does not work, let's just try it. Just reset your timeline and re-simulate. It 
it's still a bit jaggy. Still there. The other um, technique, because um, that also takes care of um, smoothing iterations in between and collision paths in between, is to reset this to 100 and then, no, no, not the smoothing iteration, yeah, that one, and then increase the sub steps to two. So for each frame, the solver is basically run twice. What's the difference between two and one and one and 200? Um, the two sub steps run everything um, under the collision tab. So resolving the collision, smoothing, um, it just runs it twice. The whole solver is run twice. While with the constraints iterations, if you just double them, it just makes sure that the springs that connect those points to form the cloth, that uh, there are 200 passes on them. So 200 okay. iterations on how you solve those springs versus just so solve it it's getting better. But ah, still, still a bit jaggy. Give this a few more. Give this 200 constraint iterations. 200. We are now at the point um, where you are a lot in Houdini. So after building your setup, after building your tool, you're now exploring its parameter space and trying to figure out which parameters to dial in and which values to dial into those parameters to make it look decent. That's yeah. usually half or more of the time than you spend um, in Houdini than actually building a tool is finding out which parameters to Yeah, I can imagine that. I mean, it's the same in cinema. Like you change a value by 0.1 and everything looks different. Yeah. And yeah, I think we're getting there mostly. I think the rest I would resolve with a bit of uh, spatial blurring in the Velm post process. Yeah, it's, it's anyway, tutorial purposes doesn't have to be perfectly. Um, I think... I could already render that in cinema. Perhaps before, um, one thing could be interesting, a random scale as well. Sure. So if you reset Let's your try timer. to Wait, I'll try to do it without you saying okay. anything. Yep. Let's copy one of these guys. Wow. Making some space. So connecting. Uh, this is how the last time it there was no exactly are they still yeah then we p scale p scale was it p scale called yeah nice you remembered yeah nice. Whew. then p scale scale is three uniform continuous Mm. Uniform? Yeah. Yes? Nice. Yes, let's go for uniform. And yeah, um, you only need one dimension. So P scale is just one overall scaling factor for the whole thing. And that's the first one or? Yeah, and that's the first one. 0. 0.5, let's see. I'm just saying you can um, set these dimensions here to only one. It won't, I think it won't do much in that case, but... No difference. 0.5 is really much already. Like this yeah. one is already very tiny. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can also set the like minimum nine, and five. maximum value. So, um, oh, okay. So what happened here with green is now this evaluates as an expression. And this happened because you used a comma. And commas um, in uh. Uh, numerical values are not used in Houdini. So you have to use a point. And then to disable the expression again, just... Um, uh, shift control click in there, I think. Shift control. Yeah. 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 And if you uh, get annoyed by all these zeros, just click onto the name here again and all those zeros should disappear. So we still have a lot of variation in scale. Yeah, yeah because you're now changing, you're, you're choosing your value between zero and zero. Ah, uh, okay. So I need to go between 0 0.9 and one. Maybe. Yeah, or 0.8. Just switch those around. Minimum and maximum values. I mean, they should work the same, but... 0.7 and... Ah, 0.7 and 1. And click, yes, so... Yeah. And now you have everything scaled between 100% and 70%. That's good. That's enough randomness here. Um, okay, that's all good. 
That's one, good. One last thing or almost last thing is if you want to render those, I assume you want to put some fabric texture on them, right? Yes. Ah, so we need yeah. UVs. Mm -hmm. You need UV coordinates. So let's see what happens if I type UV. Mm -hmm. There's something. The node you want is called UV texture. UV texture. And that goes, um, and that, wait, wait, wait. So what you want is that each of those ribbons has kind of the same UVs, right? Um, it depends a little bit. How will we, how will we be able to, well, I know that sometimes you cannot convert a Lambics from Houdini in cinema, then the animation is gone. Or wait, to be more precisely, sometimes when I'm getting, or well, not sometimes, always when I'm getting sims from Houdini guys, it's just one Alembic file. And if I want to apply several textures, I need to convert the Alembic so I have the option to select polygons. But if I do that, the animation is lost. Or the animation was lost in the last project, which I just did. So what you can do is you can group those individually and they will appear as individual groups, for example, in your um, Alembic and you can give each group a separate shader. Um, and how will we address the shader later in cinema? What do you mean address? Yeah, I mean, it's just one object. How can I apply like a selection tag to, or exactly, we need selection tags for each, for each, um, Plain, grid. What What's the function of a selection tag in Cinema 4D again? Um, to apply, we put the texture onto the Alembic and then we select the selection tag and put the selection into the material. So only, for example, this guy will get one material. Okay, so you want, you want basically you want the um, uh, ribbons have an individual texture. Yes. Know? Yeah, okay, but we can do that with grouping. Okay, then that's or with names then everything can have the same uv mm, yeah i mean uh, yeah in any ways you want um all these you want each individual grid i mean these grids will get duplicated down here so what you want is give a grid an, a uv and then duplicate those so this guy exactly and it's already set up correctly what you can do to check your orientation is um after that UV texture or after the copy to points, attach what's called a UV quick shade. UV quick, quick. Yeah, there we are. And if you just put the view flag on that, you should be able to see it, some texture. No? Yeah. Yeah, I it's just, it's, it's just, it's just good. See, right. okay. Yeah, it's stretched. So in your UV texture tag, you can account for that because the UV texture tag just projects those textures um, as it was as if it was a quadratic grid underneath it. So in this case, you have to adjust the scale to fit your um, grids um, aspect ratio. So it's we need to make the smaller. No, exactly the wrong value. Which one? This one? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what your original values for the grid were. Scaling wise. The scaling for the grid? Yeah, the scaling was 3.1. Uh, 0.1 and 3. So if you do that, if you leave that at 1, then you should put the first scale. Yeah, I mean, you can do that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just make it simple. <laughs> okay, you can do that as well. <laughs> yeah, right. And now you get UVs. Um, just um, bypass or um, unlink this UV quick shade here. We don't need it anymore. Mm, and the copy the points. Oh wait, copy the points. Uh, this one we need. Where's the quick shade? This guy. Yeah, I can go. Yeah, right. Wait to the end thing merge guy. Okay. Now the group thing, or did you have another? Um, I thought maybe we can do it with the connectivity attribute, but I'm not sure about that. Let's try it. Um, after the copy to points, add a connectivity node. After the copy to points. Uh, 
Um, yeah, let's leave it like that. And what that does is it looks at how the geometry is connected internally and if points are connected to each other and gives um, all points that are in the same geometry um, a class number that has the same number. So each of your individual ribbons here, all of the points have the same number in each individual ribbon. Okay. And then we need to export thing, mm -hmm. Alembic. Yeah, let's call the ROP Alembic out. Wait, did I choose the wrong one? Yeah. ROP Alembic. Yeah. What's the difference between Alembic and ROP Alembic? Alembic loads one, ROP Alembic writes one. Ah, perfect. Ciao, you can go. <laughs> so let's let's just check. So um, getting over those class into cinema is going to be something. Um, middle mouse on the merge node. On the merge. Wait. Yeah, thanks you. Um, okay, we've got the class here. I'm thinking how that's, it's been a long time since I uh, since I've done this, and getting this over to Cinema is one of the main reasons why I refrained from exporting to Cinema at some point because it's such a hassle to get Cinema to read this stuff correctly. Let's try it. Um, yeah, let's try it. I mean, we can see what happens. Let's and, try it. Yeah. So under the Rob Alembic. Wait, perhaps I need a few more frames, 175. Oh, I can't change. I need to extend those at first. Ah, here, 175. Yes, Rob Alambi. So under hierarchy here, if you scroll down, there's a build hierarchy from attribute. Check that. And then for the, okay. It wants a path attribute. Okay, that's a bit nasty. How do we construct that? Let me just briefly think. Perhaps we can ignore it at this point and see if I can convert the uh, Alembic in cinema. Most likely you won't be able to, but let's try it anyways. Um, I'm just thinking if there's a way that does not involve scripting to build that hierarchy attribute. Um, but for now then let's... <sighs> Yeah, let's I mean, try. Wait, wait, wait a second. Go back to the hierarchy attribute for one one second, and um, click here. No, above that. Yeah. Um, okay. Damn it. Um, okay. Could you just middle mouse on this for one more time? Dope object on the dope object. No, no, on the merge. On the merge. Oh wait, you need to. Yeah. Okay, that's a primitive attribute. Um, okay, let's try one more thing before we do that, because maybe it's easier than I thought. And go back to this connectivity node that we dropped. Connectivity? Yep. And set that connectivity type to primitive. Okay. Let's go back to the merge and middle mouse on that. Merge. Okay, and now let's go to the Rob Alembic out. Rob Alembic. Exactly. And now let's see if you can select class here. Nope, you can't. Perfect. Okay. It's going to be a hassle. <laughs> um, for now, um, you want to make sure that in here you are not rendering a single frame, but the whole animation. So frame range. And then you want to specify your output file. This dollar hip in front here says um, it specifies the folder in which your project file currently resides, which in your case is users high desktop. That's and, so and to users high desktop, it'll create the output.abc, the alembic into which it'll store the whole um, yeah. animation. Yeah, for now it's it's fine. Let's render okay. this. Okay, then hit save to disk. Save to disk. Yeah, and now it's gonna take a while. It's now rendering the the post vellum post processing as well or no 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 that is bypass that is off. Oh, okay. the thing is what we need to do later to automatically get this hierarchy so to automatically separate those individual strips into selectable geometry is um, we need to take this class attribute which is currently just a number between uh, zero and 11, because I think you have like 12 individual strips here. So each one has their own number starting at zero. We need to take that and convert it into a string. So give each one a name, mm -hmm. which is, yeah, <laughs> exactly what you say. 
<laughs> you could go with vertex colors. If everyone has a different color, then I could also use the vertex color in yeah, a... Yeah, but that's just a, that's just a hack. I mean, usually you would just write one or two lines of vex to get um, a class attribute that has a name and a path. And then um, Cinema will automatically split this up individual geometry when importing. Let's try importing that for now. Um, I think it won't already be what you expected it to be. Let's see. New shill and nice viewport <laughs> game here. I got this error all the time. It's so annoying. Look at this. It's just me. Uh, freezing the viewport. I get this like 10 times a day. It's so annoying. And it's still the background from a previous um, job. Yeah. So I have to close cinema first and then I have to open it again and then it works. I mean, you have some viewport quirks in Houdini sometimes as well. It depends on the version. The nice thing about Houdini is that they are pretty quick when it comes to their release and updating schedule. So you can expect almost a monthly update. Um, so yeah, bugs get fixed in a rather fast fashion. So we got this guy going on. So you need to, wait, 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 wait. You want to scale this by a hundred centimeters. So the scale otherwise is um, way too small. And how was our frame rate anyway? I never uh, I think 24 by default. 24, what's we that can, for? A cinema. Default. Um, in the bottom left corner, there's this. Whoop, wait, wait a second. Go back to Houdini. Where would you go? Right. Houdini. Yeah. And then click here. And you can see your current project settings. And yeah, it's 24 FPS. Oh. That's a weird one. Who uses 24 frames? Cinema. Really? Still 24? Yeah, cinema. That's projected into. Your huge cinema audience houses. It's 24 mm. frames. Quite stuttery. Yeah, and there you have it. Um, although, if you, yeah, see, everything is merged there. And I mean, you have a bunch of, what, what is that, point groups? Or what is it that comes with it? Yeah, wait, let's see, first of all, bit. place. Nice. That's mm -hmm. good. Then let's try to press C. And. It wow. works anyway. It still works. Then everything's solved. That's nice. Because now if I can convert the Alembic, I can just use selection and I can select. Okay. I mean, yeah, if you can do objects. that. But what are those tags here? Let me undo that before we made the conversion. Um, ah, so. A lot of tags. Vertex map. Oh, those are the velocities. Ah, okay, that's interesting. So it brings in any type of attribute with a vertex map that we had on there. Okay, so we we, we might want to clean this up as well so it doesn't import all the simulation attributes that you don't Also, need. we need the motion vector for yeah, those motion. Are, those are stored in V for velocity. They are called V. v. For I think it was, it was way in the beginning, I think, one of the way first ones you clicked was V. But we will clean that up. Let's head back oh, yeah, to Houdini here. and clean that up. Perfect. Don't save. Go back to Houdini. Okay. So um, after the merge and before the Rob Alembic, um, we will add an attribute delete. Exactly that. So in here, we're going to delete you can put um, asterisks like those little stars into all of those here into the point vertex mode and detail attributes. Wait, what, where, how, which stars? Ask, yeah, the stars. Yeah, exactly that. So that's, that tells you to delete every point attribute, delete every vertex and every primitive and every detail attribute. However, as you already mentioned, we want to, for example, not delete everything, but we want to keep the velocities. Yeah? Mm -hmm. the velocities are stored on the point attributes and we can do that by after the asterisks, um, putting in a space. And then using the hat symbol, that's this one. <laughs> Which one? The, the weird one, the, this one. Accent aigu. Yeah, and, uh, is that a circonflex? Or a graph or something. I forgot that. Circonflex, I think. Circonflex, circonflex, how to do it? Um, above your tab. 
above my tip with oh, alt no, with shift. Island, not shift. Alt. No, where, where? <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Click here. That was alt. I, I, I don't, I don't know how he did that, but click here. Here, here. And where's the? Uh, <laughs> Go to can't OBJ. See this one OBJ. Blue. <laughs> OBJ. Go in there again. And then why the fu how the how the fu close this here close and um, add a properties tab again here <laughs> how is it new paint tab type no 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 no, no, no. close the text list plus Take list draw. okay plus plus new paint tab type parameters okay we're back so don't press alt and the symbol <laughs> <laughs> okay, we were working here. Attribute. So, so shift. Shift, then, uh, yeah, exactly. And then a small V for velocity. Okay, that tells Houdini to delete everything except V. If you middle mouse on this node here, you can see if that worked. And it did. It did not. <laughs> so we're not excluding V here. Where can we see how, what? I see random stuff. Okay, what we're looking for is the point attributes here. This One before point. was just like, I think, three lines of attributes here. And now we only have the position left. So we deleted most of the attributes, yeah? Yeah. However, we wanted to keep the V attribute that stores the velocity, which we did not succeed at. Okay. Then? Is that maybe two spaces in here? No, just one. But let's, okay, let's get rid of that space and try it um, as well. And again, mm, um, just click somewhere here and then middle mouse on this again. <laughs> okay, now we kept everything. Okay, let's try a space in there again. Because I have the feeling, okay, click somewhere here so it executes and then middle mouse on this. Okay, now it does. No, it I, think what I think what happened before is um, you just entered something here and then directly middle mouse on this. So this node actually didn't execute. So you have to just left click somewhere here for this node to execute. Okay, perfect. No, um, got... Also, wait, 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 wait. Okay. One, one, I'm always too fast. Keep, we want to keep the UVs, so do the same thing here on the vertex attributes, but just do the accent aigu. I think that's it, and um, I think UV is Wait. the attribute name. Wait, I'm... Shift. I'm pressing Shift. Do you have a cap? No, it's just, it. I just have to press it with nothing. Do you have caps lock on? By no. The... Okay. Well, Before it was Shift. <laughs> <laughs> that's weird, whatever. UV. So, UV. Okay. Click somewhere click somewhere, else. and then like the mouse on that, and now we have the UVs coming over as well. Nice. So we have UVs, we have velocities, we have the point positions all there. The only thing I want to do for now, and this is overwhelming for you currently, because we're going to write a bit of VEX just to get this automatic separation of the individual geometries for now. And that's a bit involved, admittedly. Um, for now, we'll just write a bit of VEX and then you can save that and use that to your liking if you should ever run into that situation again. Yeah, I will. So um, for now, let's just accept what we're going to do. Okay. Yeah. So we want to use a primitive wrangle. A primitive wrangle is used to execute VEX code on primitives. Um, and we wire that in after the merge. Primitive wrangle after the merge. Yes. And in here, okay, a middle mouse on it again, so we can see what we need to work with. Okay, so we want to take this class here, which is currently um, a number between 0 and 11, demarking each of those individual um, grids here, and want to mm -hmm. turn it into a string, which reads something like, I don't know, slash object, and then 0, object 1, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? Yeah. So we want to take this zero and just attach it to a string that says obj and then just want to convert the zero to a string and attach it to it. And that's what we're going to do. All right. So we need to type in something in here. We need to type in code in here. Yes. And um, you want to create a string. So you type string. String. Yep. Then uh, space. And now we call this string, I don't know, path. 
then an equal sign. So we now tell with what, space or without with space. You can do it with without. It doesn't matter. With it just looks nice. Okay, and then you do the um, the how you call the quotation marks in English. Um, quotation marks. Um... Yeah, those. Um, and then I think we need to use a forward slash. But I'm forward not sure about that. Seven, the one over the seven. Yes, the one on the seven. I think so. We'll we'll figure out if it's a forward or backward slash, but I think it's a forward slash. Um, then OBJ or something, whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter. Um, and then uh, quotation marks again. And then a semicolon. Oh no, no semicolon yet. But a plus, because to this string, we want to add the numbers. And to convert those numbers that are stored in the class attribute, we call a function which is called i2a. So if you just type i2a, mm -hmm. and then um, parentheses. Parentheses, what was that again? Uh, the roundish uh, brackets, klammern. The roundish. Um, the ones on the 8 and 9 on the German. Is it board. alt no. 8? Um, no, no, it's just. Um, uh, just around once these ones. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the... and, and no space bar in between the I2A and the first um, parentheses. No space bar. Yeah. And in there, um, you type the at, like in the email. At. Class. C-L-A-S-S. -S. Closing parentheses. And semicolon. Uh, no, a semicolon. Ta -da. Perfect. Perfect. And now... Um, just a new line and you type s at path but at sign or yep at path equals to path equals to path and then a semicolon you want to know what we did here or you just want to accept it and leave it at that we can we can skip it for now <laughs> All right. Um, click somewhere here and then middle mouse on the primitive wrangle to see um, if that executed properly. Okay, we've got a path here now. And now please click on here on the geo spreadsheet. And um, drag this over here. So this scroll bar, scroll to the side until we see path. So oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. We ha you have to click on this one first. Where, where did you paint? There's so much paint everywhere. Here. <laughs> okay, yeah. You can see now here in the path, we have the OBJ0. And if you scroll down, further, way more further. It's lots and lots of scrolling. Okay, you can see now we have the OBJ1. Okay, that's working. So each so point has... Each primitive value. Now, so each polygon. Ah, uh, so each each polygon now has a plane path. has one hundred polygons, ninety nine polygons. No, no, this is polygon number ninety nine here. It belongs to the first plane, and it is called OBJ zero in the path. Oh wait, we need to go to OBJ one. Yep, and you can also just take this scroll handle here and drag it down a bit because it's lots and lots of primitives in here. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. There's a lot of. Okay. But see now that, now that work here, we have class one and now we store an OBJ one four OBJ four and so on that worked. Yeah. Okay. You can go back to your scene and have a look at that. Scene view. Mm -hmm. um, and now I hope at least all that we need to do is in the, oh wait, first <laughs> we are creating this path attribute, but here in the attribute delete, we're deleting it again. So we'll have to exclude that as well. From the primitive attributes here, again with the hat, um, exclude the path. Perfect. And then click somewhere and again middle mouse on it to see if it comes through. And it does. Perfect. Okay, now on the Rob Alembic, just a few under hierarchy, scroll down. Um, build hierarchy from attribute. We already have that selected and it's already called path. So, okay, try exporting it again. It was a bit faster because the simulation was already cached. Oh, nice. Let's see. Kill everything for now and test number two. 
again make sure to scale it by 100 and yes yeah, yeah and now you've got individual objects here that's pretty handy again it was a bit involved there might be easier ways of doing this it's just i like to go by vex because that's what i know and that's i I by now find Vex pretty easy once you learn it. Um, we can go over what we did in Vex, um, but basically... That is, no, that's really actually pretty easy. Perhaps I should, because I'm right now booked at Calenta Kids. <laughs> I'm always getting only one file. Perhaps I should tell them this, this hack. Type in this and that. Yeah. It would be so nice to get individual elements. It's just quicker to apply textures. Does it work with everything? Everything I do now, I can just use well, this. Well, 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 what, well, what this does, I mean, this primitive wrangle that you wrote um, only works together with the connectivity node we specified up there. Connect this guy. Yeah, this one. And you could also drop that below the vellum solver, but there it's, it's better there because it only executes once and not each time frame. Um, it would yield the same result if you put it below the vellum solver in this case. So what connectivity does, again, it looks at which points are connected into one whole connected piece of geometry. Yeah. And gives each of those So polygons. that's actually, wait, before you, I always have to refer myself to cinema. So that's kind of the same thing if I will look on our previous build, which is mm -hmm. just one piece. Mm -hmm. And when I go connected object is, is doing that. What you can see here. Yeah, exactly. It's just doing that procedurally. So, nice. um, and each connected object gets one number, usually starting at zero. And then in our node down there, we're reading out those numbers and just turning them into a path, like in a the file primitive path. wrangle. Exactly. What we're doing here is just we're creating a file path. So we're calling each individual number and just storing it and calling it into a file path that says slash obj0 slash obj1 slash obj2, la la la. And this path can then be used by the Alembic output to create subfolders in the Alembic for each object, if you want so. Nice. That's pretty good. That's what it's doing. So as long as your geometry is connected, it will put each connected element in a subfolder, so to speak, just as an analogy. So as long as the amount of the points are not changing, this works. That doesn't matter if the points are changing or not, um, just as long as they are connected. Nice. Cool. I would say this is a was a very interesting class. <laughs> Definitely yeah. have to do it again tomorrow. Try to remember all the steps. Yeah, I can see how the, how lots of this is frustrating when you're coming from another tool, especially one such as Cinema 4D. Well, it's not frustrating. It's just look at this. I just press press play. It's so fast, and there's so much polygons compared to what I could do in Cinema. So this is so motivating that I think it's, it hopefully will help me to not get lost in old habits. I mean, one hint would be if you, I mean, you can always ask me if you have issues with some certain things. I mean, some of this is unnecessarily complex, for example, getting those individual parts into an Alembic. Um, but also what I suggest to you is um, just give Mops a try. Just try out Mops, download it. It's available for free. They have a free version, they have a paid version. Um, that unlocks lots of functionality that's kind of hidden in Houdini or is very specific. You have to know your ways around it and it exposes that in a very user-friendly way. So for example, when you were asking to only randomly rotate your ribbons around one axis, I think that's easier done in Mops than here. But is it really worth it? Because I mean, the way is going to be that I will watch all the tutorials, yours, others, I don't know, and we'll probably no will will use that. It so depends. It, I mean, there, is a, there are advantages of, of just using run-of-the-mill Houdini nodes. Um, there are advantages of using pre-built assets such as mops. Um, it totally depends. If you feel like you're comfortable with just run-of-the-mill Houdini nodes, stick to them. Um, if you feel you're limited and would like to have a bit easier access to some of those features, you can look either at MOPS and definitely at SideFX Labs. SideFX Labs is another toolkit that um, SideFX published. It's free. You can just um, uh, install it here by adding um, your Labs shelf up here and then 
um, just download the labs tools and there are a bunch of really great tools in there as well. Download so, yeah, shelves. If you go to shelves, no, no, if you go to shelves and then side effects labs down here. Side effects labs. Exactly, and then you can just click update tool set and it'll download it. Update, start yeah. launcher. <laughs> Update. Update. Yeah, um, and that'll give you um, quite a few additional nodes that expose some really nice functionality. It's easy to use. Okay. Yeah, but to be honest, my start will be, I will watch tutorials and I will do identically step-by-step step the yeah, same sure. thing as, sure. as they will do. Sure, if but, you hit something and have questions, just ask. Yes. Right, so I think this was a good thing perhaps for everyone who's thinking to switch to Houdini as well. Um, yeah, I think it exposes some strengths and some weaknesses or just what you have to be prepared for on the good and on the bad side as well. Yeah, I will make a render of it. Nice. <laughs> um, good luck, Vince. Thank you very much. Thanks for the private session. It was a pleasure. So Thank I'll hit stop on that one. And yes. talk to you soon. This is an addendum because when thinking and pondering about what we just did and discussing it, it occurred to me that all the VEX coding I did was totally unnecessary and was just to me being stupid. So the whole thing is way easier than thought. Um, and what we came up with here is, Vince, if you scroll up again to the um, connectivity node, if you set up your connectivity node like this um, and tell it to store the primitives connectivity in an attribute called um, path and set this attribute type to be of string. And then you can give it some prefix here, piece, obj, whatever. Um, that's all you need. And what you can then do is go down to the rop alembic out. And under hierarchy, just scroll down here and check build hierarchy from attribute and make sure that the path attribute has the same attribute name as the one we specified in the connectivity sub, which we already called path. So you don't have to do anything but check build hierarchy from attribute. And then that also splits your file into individual subfolders, so to speak, without Perfect. any vex. Nice. Maybe a bit easier and a <laughs> bit less hassle. Just wasn't aware that that was possible. So we're both learning something here. Yeah, that's a good thing. All right, that's that. Bye-bye. <laughs>